Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views, with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Information on Hellgate Keep can be found in Cloak and Dagger, the Hellsga uh, Hellgate Keep Adventure module, and there is a line or two in the Gatekeeper's Crystal Write-Up and Volo's Guide to All Things Magical. I'll be talking more about that artifact later on, plus of course the Forgotten Realms Wiki and uh, Candlekeep Forum. Hellsgate, Hellgate Keep stands on the westernmost of three rivers that join to form the Delembir. The westernmost stream was once known as the Askel Stream, is now known as Skull Creek. This infamous city is the Moor of the Nine Hells, the most evil and dangerous place in all of the North. It was once known as Askelhorn because it was built on the slopes of the jutting natural peak known as Askel's Horn. The keep's soaring stone walls and towers were built by Elani Elves long ago. They were intended to guard Turnstone Pass and the northern reaches of the Elves realm from the periodic attacks of Orc Hordes. The elves who built it made one mistake. They sympathetically turned their new newly built fortress over to human refugees from fallen netheril. Although it could be argued that they simply found the task of guarding the pass and the occasional pitching of life or death battle with a ravening horde uh, of orcs more suited to the humans than themselves. After all, they had been wardens of the north before the humans even started forging steel. The humans of Askelhorn were proud, and thanks to their heritage, very strong in magic, they strove to recapture the glory of fallen Mithranor, even as the elves of Silvery Moon do today. However, they overreached themselves. One particular wizard, named Wulgreth, was afraid of losing power within the city as they squabbled amongst their majocracy, falling back into the, uh, the ancient netheral way of government. So in 820 DR, he summoned devils to grant him the power to overcome his rivals. However, his craft and will were insufficient for the task and the devils were never fully controlled, but instantly seeing the situation available before them, pretended that everything was going according to Wulgreth's plans. Wulgreth had actually created a gateway to the Nine Hells in order to summon these devils more easily, so the Bartorians slowly but surely infiltrated the city, at first learning all they could about the most powerful and influential people, seeming like nothing more than meek and compliant servants, taking care to remain shapeshifted, concealing their true forms. They grew bolder, scheming and manipulating, acting as go-betweens for the powerful mages of the city, encouraging rivalries, misunderstanding and fears. They are ageless beings, with patience beyond that of a human, their techniques of manipulation honed over tens of thousands of years. So, even the mighty mages, intelligent as weary as they are, had little ch chance in the long run. After a few decades, some of the devils convinced their wizard masters to take their step and onto the transformation into lichdom as a path to greater power, gifting them a slightly altered ritual that gave the forces of Bartol magical control over them once the transformation was complete. The controlled liches were a ruthless force and plunged the city into a dystopian nightmare quite quickly. And with the power balance now swung overwhelmingly in the devil's favor, they threw off their mantle of disguise and ruled the city openly, torturing and devouring the human citizens at will. In desperation, many women and men of Askelhorn turned to the forbidden grimoires and scrolls of their ancestors, the ancient magical empire of Netheril. With them in foul rituals, they summoned demons to fight the devils, and it worked. It worked far beyond what they had imagined. In 882 DR, they performed their ritual and a great force of demons poured into the city as the disruptive power of the abyss was amplified with every demon that ripped its way across the dimensional barriers and rampaged through the town. For the inhabitants, it was as if the gates of hell had finally swung wide open. Like any other engagement in the eternal blood war, the slaughter was incredible and savage. Humans, liches and their undead minions, demons, devils and hordes of twisted nightmare mutants were obliterated in fire and fury. Those who managed to actually escape escape fled in terror, and frightened folk across the northern uh, northern reaches rechristened Asmalhorn as the name Hellgate Keep, from a bardic ballad describing its fall. With all of the original wizards who some of them now destroyed, the demons, under the leadership of the powerful Baelor named Grinthark, declared Askelhorn their territory. The bard who composed the epic ballad of the events was named Meastar, and he was actually there when it happened, which is why the song is renowned for the depth of feeling it evokes when it is performed properly. 
Grimthark had brought more of his kin to Faerun and began a campaign to expand his area of control. Elven, Erlin, and Dwarven Ar Ar Armarindar fell quickly to his hordes as they were not prepared for such swift and decisive action on the demon forces. When the Tanari finally uh, started burning the forests of Upvale and corrupting the Far Forest, several of the powers of Faerun, including Illustrial, uh, banded together to contain the evil. With their combined power and the aid of others, they sealed off the keep in midsummer of the year of the Fell Firebreak in 886 DR, establishing powerful wards that would trap any greater or true Tanari within the keep's walls and preventing them from summoning any more of their kin. So, Grimthark ruled the lands for centuries, hampered by the wards from summoning more powerful minions, but using the minions he had, who were not powerful enough or were not true blood demons to, uh, enough to be stopped by the wards, uh, he used them to roam around the lands gaining more allies and taking slaves and captives, dragging them back to Hellsgate Keep. Uh, but a chance encounter in the year of the wave, 1364 DR, with seven elves who were caught spying on the keep was to be the turning port point in the horror that became Hellgate Keep. Shortly after the beginning of the year of the wave, a patrol of for the keep capturing seven elves from Everesca who had been spying on the Citadel. These elves were brought to Grinthark and after 17 months of intense <coughs> interrogation, he decided to have some fun. They were taken to his personal gladiatorial arena and given their arms and armor back. They looked at each other nervously, wondering why they'd been allowed to have their gear. When their opponent stepped into the ring, the worst fears were confirmed. It was none other than Grimthark himself. For a while, he toyed with them, striking only to wound and not to kill. Not yet. But he had no idea what the elves bore, nor would he have understood his danger if he had known the names of their swords. For the lore of the shattering swords of Coronal Yinloth? Uh, Yin Yinloth? was unknown in Hellgate. The eyes of the elves met in understanding they brought their swords together with a crash. The blades exploded into hundreds of razor-sharp shards that engulfed the startled Baylor. His toughened skin and magical resistance allowed him to survive a full minute before being completely shredded. During these 60 seconds, he managed to claw three elves into the whirlwind with him, uh, taking small pleasure in watching them die before he himself fell. The remaining elves, of course, had no chance of survival against the Tanari commanders that were left but they did manage to take down Grinthark's rock second in command, who was the only being after Grinthark who was capable of controlling the rest of the demons. With the t commanders dead, the rest turned on each other, um, unable to escape the city themselves because of the wards, they tore themselves to pieces. Only seven of the greater Tanari remained. The three senior Maroliths agreed to form a triumvirate, uh, to uh, try and wire it to rule over the keep from then on. Of course, that didn't last long either. Infighting and plotting dominated their days. Finally, two of them, Zahn of the Five Heads, uh, Five Hands, and Mulvasius, the Septed, assassinated the third, Amaskura, the Tricoil, and divided the rule of the keep between them. Zahn took control of the Tanari and the undead, while Mulvasius controlled the Cambians, Orcs, Humans, and other slaves. Mulvasius and her son uh, Kanya plotted to overthrow San and all of the Khan and all the while Kanya was plotting the downfall of his mother. Once this was all accomplished, word of the slaughter within the keep eventually spread to the outside wards. Radok, the mad wizard gathered forces from fallen lands and marched on the keep. San sent her troops to uh, engage them. However, Kanya and a small group of slaves managed to escape the keep and made their way to the high forest to find Tan uh, Tanta Hagara, shaman of the Blue Bear Uthgard tribe, which becomes more important later on. Radak's forces attacked the main gates of the keep and walls of the keep in 1368 DR, but though he decimated the undead and Tanari, the keep remained in San's control. However, San was weakened by the battles and Milvasius killed him and conquered the keep. Uh, Kanya brought the Blue Bear tribe into the keep, now turning most of the slaves within into breeding stock. But Malvasius did not expect the treachery of her son. Kanya, bearing the very weapons that had been used to kill Am uh, Amasura, slew her first as she thought her victory was complete. Kanya took control of the keep's forces and wedded Tanta Hagara, allowing her to think that she was in power. Needless to say, Kanya uh, wasn't done with his plotting. Uh, following year, the year of the uh, gauntlet, two bards, Krishana Fireglen and Spellviper, who was also a priest of Mistra, infiltrated the citadel, citadel posing as two of the Bluebeard Barbarians. 
They worked to undermine the power of Tanta Hagara and Kanya, even as many sorties were launched into the surrounding areas, Sundabar, the High Forest, and even close to the gates of Silvery Moon itself. Finally, the Mist Master of the Citadel of Mists was readying to uh, spring his final defense. The two bards he had sent into the keep each carried a piece of the Gatekeeper's Crystal. Uh, powerful artifact, artifact I'll talk about in some detail. He had positioned themselves uh, at the stop top of the east and west of the tower um, of the keep and Mistmaster teleported just outside the keep and activated the crystal. The gatekeeper's crystal was a powerful, well still is, a powerful magical device. When assembled it looks like a foot wide three pointed star made of carved onyx with some otherworldly metal woven through it. According to legend, the crystal has been created by a powerful lich. The truth, however, is that it originated from the Outlands and has been carried by a mysterious being called the Gatekeeper, whose sole duty was, to, apparently, to guard the crossroads of a, um, a series of gates across the plains and spheres, preventing anyone who wished to restrict access to it from blocking the travel of others. It was stolen, with the assistance of a deity, it said, by uh, Lerachlia, a lich and ice priestess of Oril of the Great Glacier, known as the Ice Queen, and as part of her attempt to conquer Myth on Dath. It was made up of three separate parts. Um, each of these shards was more powerful in their own right, but devastating when brought together as a whole. When the crystal was used as a whole, particularly uh, to destroy a mythal, its three shards separated and scattered across a vast area, always including other planes of existence. So it's kind of like the Rod of Seven Parts in a way. Anyone who touched any one of these shards of the crystal would know instantly the direction in which the other shards lay, although they were, um, even if they're not on the same plane. When the three shards were joined, the wielder of the crystal was given the ability to create either a dead magic zone or a wild magic zone, as well as knowledge of any gates or portals within 50 miles and the ability to open or close them. You can imagine how powerful this artifact would be if you took it to the city of Sigil. Bringing the crystal in contact with any creature or item that was not native to the plane where it was found would send it back that, to that um, place which it was native to. Combining the shards of the crystal in pairs manifested different effects. The first and second block clerics, paladins and rangers from using their magical abilities within range. The second and third did the same to wizards, sorcerers and bards, while the first and third blocked undead from the positive energy plane or negative energy plane if they bore such a connection. Individually, the first shard also blocked necromantic transmutation and enchantment spells, the second shard blocked evocation, conjuration and illusion spells, and the third blocked divination, abjuration and enchantment spells. If all three shards of the crystal were divided and carried um, out so as to surround the area and their powers cast, any mythal or ward which lay partly or completely inside their triangle of effect would be destroyed in an explosion of fiery violet light. Any act which also, uh, well, this usually collapsed any buildings and slew any creatures found in the area, as well as for many miles around it, thanks to the resultant earth tremors and explosions. So, when the crystal was used at Hellgate Keep, the wards around the keep were violently compressed, destroyed many of the buildings and even much of the underground complex. Only a tenth of the inhabitants survived. The great treant Turlang was ready out in the forest and systematically surrounded up, uh, rounded up and destroyed anything found in this forest that was fleeing the area, including Tantra Hagara and her army. Thus ended the Blue Bear Uthgar tribe, for the time being at least. Turlang then blocked the way out of the keep. A very few daring adventurers even attempted to enter the Vale and it is said there are some who will show others the way that to get in there for a price. Finally. In 1369, the year of the gauntlet, adventurers managed to destroy Hellgate Keep by activating some um, the, the artifact itself. It was a suicide mission for those who were actually holding the thing, but it worked. Uh, the keep's been ugly, uh, utterly destroyed, and very large part of Force of Devils um, were on the warpath elsewhere at the time, so um, they survived the artifact's effects. The devils and other uh, the demons and other fiends have since almost been completely destroyed by other forces, um, including the mighty treants the, that now guard the fortress and ruins. And any of the uh, demons that try to get in back in there usually get slaughtered. The first mention of Hellscape Keep's destruction was in the North Box set. Uh, this was then elaborated on in the Hellgate Keep adventure, and then parts of the adventure were spun off into many other 
uh, products such as Cloak and Dagger or a series of novels, but no novel has dealt exclusively with the city's destruction. A side effect of the destruction of Hellgate Keep was the freeing of Elvin Feyre of House Dalagragath. The Feyre are the result of interbreeding between sun elves and demons in an attempt to strengthen, uh, strengthen the sun elf bloodline, so they are sometimes referred to as elven cambians rather than tieflings. Countess Saria Dalagragath um, was a sun elf half fiend sorceress, leader of the demon fae, and priestess and princess of House Dlargragath. She was over 5,000 years old as of 1374 DR. Actually, the module Hellgate Keep first mentioned the freeing of the Fairy, uh, but this was only the th um, there was only three members of the House Dlargragath. With the Cloak and Dagger supplement adding more Feyre to the mix, it built on the lore of the Dlargragas that were in the module adding to their number who were now free of the place. The Feyre turned out to be far more important to the overall providence of the place, and I have to wonder, not for the first time, as to the wisdom of the elves ever turning the fortress of Askelhorn over to the Netherese humans in the first place. You see, Sarya was magically imprisoned thousands of years ago in a magical tomb on top of um, the peak of Askelhorn where Askelhorn Fortress was built. This would have been fine, the elves left her very well sealed in there, um, tying the binding to a powerful artifact, but in 1369 DR she was set free when the explosion basically cracked open her prison when the Harpers used their gatekeeper's crystal to raise the city to the ground. The original elves obviously never dreamed that anyone would be stupid or powerful enough to do that. In 1374 DR, consumed with a terrible wrath for being imprisoned for thousands of years, Sarya proceeded to take her vengeance on the descendants of her long dead enemies. She freed the remainder of the Feyre kin from uh, Na Kerim, Kerim Horath, which means the nameless dungeon, and moved her hideout beneath L uh, Lothan to the Silver Spires of Mythglarak. This was where she corrupted the mythal located there and perverted its wards, using them to instead summon an army of demons bound to her service. As is their way, with evil power seeming to draw the orcs, bugbears and goblins like moth to a flame, they gathered to her and were gladly recruited by Saya, their new overlord, smelling a, a fight in the wind you could say. As is, um, as is their way. Sarya first attacked a small wood elf settlement in the high forest, then launched an attack on Everisker itself. But after lackluster results in both attempts, she decided to secretly move into the ruins of Mithranor and carve out a kingdom in the forest of Cormanthor. Here she would uh, press into service both demons and devils. Not only was her residency of the former glorious Mithranor a dire insult, to elven kind, but Sarya fully intended to use it as a stronghold to slowly conquer the entire region of the Daelins, the Moon Sea, and Sembia. From her ancient perspectives, she was just interested in conquest of the former empire of the elves. With the help of her mysterious fiendish patron, the Branded King, Sarya even got the lingering powers of Mithranor's mythal to work in her favour. You see, she had found two of the three parts of the Gatekeeper's Crystal, one in the ruins of Hellgate Keep immediately after she was set free, the other she tracked down using that first crystal and recovered it from a volcano in Avernus. So violent was the result of its activation in Hellgate Keep, the, the crystal was sundered, and as is its way, it was scattered across the multiverse. Or perhaps some uh, devil managed to grab it before returning to Bartor during the mayhem. In 1371 DR, the mages of Raylock, uh, Dormer, located one of the shards and kept it in uh, Nandiaron's army, armory in the Tara Raylock, and, but this was um, stolen by demonic invaders in 1374 and promptly returned to Zarya, thus completing the device. As of Alturiac 16 in 1374 uh, DR, Zarya used the complete crystal to utterly dispel all of the magical protections of Nar. Uh, Kerim Horath and freed almost 2,000 Feyre imprisoned within for the past 5,000 years. But the forces of good finally rallied <laughs> under this threat, and Sarya's plans were eventually thwarted by an elven army of several Merithar, the uh, Merithar, the mercenary army, armies of Sembia, and various small armies of the Daelands, and in no small part by the efforts of the sun elf wizard Erevan Teshur. Who knows what other menaces 
the ancient elven forces left behind in the north and the western coastal territories of Faerun, that the relatively new civilizations there are yet to accidentally unleash on themselves. Such is the nature of the world of Toril and the reason this place is called Forgotten Realms. Oh, and in case you wondered, the Gatekeeper Crystal is still at large, in parts or in whole, as the only way to destroy the thing is to either place it inside a whole and uncorrupted mythal for 1001 years, or by closing the nexus of the gate of the plains where the Gatekeeper originally guarded. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for more exclusive content as well as the full scripts for this video and various other and lots of other videos. Buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride uh, from a Teespring store. Check out the Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.